Well, we'll get the conversation going if there's nothing else. If you don't have anything coming into your chat, we're going to move on to our next speaker, which is nice tie-in is Dr. Sampiti from Kansas State. So, Ignacio, thank you for joining hey. us today all the way from, from Manhattan, buddy. Uh, <laughs> thank you. The, the room is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, can you guys see the screen? Yeah. Okay. Brian? Okay. Excellent. So um, today I would like to just briefly introduce this topic on nitrogen fixation and nitrogen balance. Um, as a part of the RAIN project, uh, one of the few things that we are looking is trying to understand how we can improve nitrogen use efficiency. Uh, and not only improving nitrogen use efficiency for crops like sorghum or corn, but also we are looking at some legumes. So, and before we get into the idea of exploring new legumes, one of the topics that I would like to briefly discuss was specifically about the question of nitrogen fixation and nitrogen balance. I think that for many years, uh, discussions with farmers, we always have conversations about the sustainability of soybeans in our systems, but we really ne never come up with the exactly numbers and, and potential problems that we can see in the future. So I will try to to show a few things and examples on, on, on things that we quantify on soybeans. And then I took this uh, from Tyson. So thanks for helping uh, Tyson before my presentation. So it's just to introduce the project. Um, is uh, the project that we are working on is uh, the Rainfed Agriculture Innovation Network, specifically focused on Kansas, Oklahoma, but also we have people working on USDA, University of Maryland. Uh, and one of the interesting sections of the projects is that we are trying to combine economists, uh, field uh, people with a different type of expertise from soils, fertility, crops, and with modelers, because our end goal is specifically to understand, can we improve productivity on our rainfed systems, but also is, can we develop some support decision tools then that we can uh, uh, downscale these tools uh, and help farmers to take decisions in, on these systems. And then connected to, to this part of the project, one of the main questions that we, we are asking, and then I think that is a concept that has been introduced in the past, is about this, the nitrogen credit. Anytime that we talk about legumes or we talk about um, those crops, I mean, like in this case, soybeans on the systems, there is this conversation about the credits. And similar is when we are talking about alfalfa and then there is a lot of talk about, okay, yes, you have some nitrogen credits for your following crop in the rotation. Uh, and I wanna just provide some light and, and we will be going through the presentation, clarifying some of those concepts. Before we get into, into specifically this nitrogen credit issue, uh, the first things that you need to see is, is specifically why soybeans? Why soybeans, they need so much nitrogen? So yeah, it's a nice example. I mean, this figure probably has 20, 30 years, but I can tell you that it still is extremely relevant on the sense that figure shows in the X, in the Y axis shows amount of nitrogen per unit of photosynthate. And in the X axis shows amount of uh, grams in the seeds per unit of photosynthate. And then I circulate on the slide soybeans. So if you look at soybeans are one of the few crops, if not the crop, basically needs more nitrogen per unit of carbon. And then when you are producing seeds, as we all know, I mean, it's a high protein crop. And this has implications. And the implications are if fixation is not enough, and we'll discuss in one second, there is a really hunger for nitrogen. And in many situations, we need to start thinking about if the soil will be the element to supply and to satisfy that, that nutrition need. Then we have some other crops that we are looking at least, for example, we are doing some uh, testing on lentils. Uh, we are doing some testing on peas. And then most of the times uh, we, are, we were doing some testing on the rotation on cow peas, uh, also in chickpeas. And most of the times our main goal is to use these crops as what I call more service crops. They are basically crops that they are not in many situations or in some cases for harvesting more when we are going into winter 
evaluations. Uh, right now we have a winter evaluations on a few different crops, uh, uh, even penny crests, looking at the possibilities of trying to add different, different crops in the rotation. And then one of the main aspects on these crops is not only the, I mean, the sustainability standpoint and the diversity on the rotation, but also thinking about the ability to provide nitrogen to the next crop and what will be the potential impact. So these are the still questions that uh, I think that we have a lot of information, but many times we are only focusing in many of our research in one crop, but we don't have an idea of the entire system. So important to understand soybeans, yes, require the greatest amount of nitrogen per unit of seed is the highest. And nitrogen for soybeans plays a major role. Uh, and we, I mean, one, most of the time we just neglect this issue because we say, well, I just inoculate the, the seeds and I'm done. And in many situations, we are seeing a lot of issues with inoculation. Uh, in many issues, uh, many of these problems are in, in also in very, very low pH soils. When we are in below five pH, uh, five units of pH, so we are seeing a lot of problems that we need to really have a solution in many situations for, for adding soybeans in the rotation. Before we get into too far into the fixation and trying to shed some light on this balance uh, of credit, first we need to understand that things have changed quite a bit on soybeans. It's the same for corn, but on soybeans, if you look at the <clears throat> excuse me evolution from the 1980s, uh, blue bars are the yields over time, you see that the yields over time on soybeans, they are having going up. And one of the main changes on changes in yield on the red bars, we are showing the total number of seeds per plant, seeds per unit area. So clearly yields on soybeans went up in the last 30 years. And most of those changes are <clears throat> strictly connected to number of seeds uh, per unit area. What happened to the total weight of those seeds? Most of the times we see that if you put on the same figure, the yields in blue, and the seed weight, you will see that the seed weight, it remains very constant. And the questions are, is that a problem? Is that showing that we didn't have any improvement on seed weight? I'm not too concerned because if we are increasing the number of seeds per plant, adding more productivity, my concern was that we are adding more seeds by the, uh, via decreasing the seed weight. In this case, it's showing us that we are increasing the number of seeds and the seed weight maintains very constant. So that's a very positive aspect uh, for increasing productivity of soybeans. And then there are always questions about, and we explore this topic many times, I mean, should we apply nitrogen to soybeans? And then that's something that, like it or not, that question comes all the time. And I will say that we finished this study and then there are other studies that are currently being done looking at the same question, okay? So for that reason, we have, I'm presenting this study, we tested different varieties from different years. We did these studies in Kansas. We also replicated in Argentina. Uh, we look at the situation, what the farmer will do, no nitrogen application. And then we look at some other concepts that some farmers are testing or they are thinking about adding 30 pounds of soybeans, uh, R3 really late, or the, more experimental treatment, if we want to say, which is applying nitrogen all the time to soybeans. And we know that if we do that, basically the plant becomes very lazy. So the plant basically doesn't inoculate, and then the plant depends exclusively from the fertilizer. And then economically, it doesn't make any sense, uh, but we wanted to test that possibility to see, are we missing, um, are we leaving leaf, uh, a yield on the, on the fields just because we are a uh, nitrogen is a limiting factor. So these are some of the results in green. Um, the figure is showing the yields uh, over time. In the excess, we have years. So in green, we have a situation with full nitrogen and then the rest, the orange and the brown is the situations that are probably the most common without nitrogen application or with 50 pounds. So clearly it's telling us that even when it's small, we are seeing that the situations with full nitrogen, they usually tend to yield consistently more. And if you look at Kansas, uh, and if you look at the varieties also from Argentina, so they show exactly the same. We are showing all the time that the modern varieties, 
current varieties, it looks like for these environments that we tested, they need a little more nitrogen. So they were running out of nitrogen towards the end of the season. And the changes were between 10, 12% and then of higher yields and in, in Argentina was around 4%. So of course we have yield gain, which is always good to, to prove the point. Uh, soybean yields improved close to 29 to 20% in the last 30 years. And then another interesting factor, I mean, connected to this is like, yes, the yields, when we are applying full nitrogen treatments, seems to be always a little bit higher than the situation that we just are inoculating soybeans. But we know that economically, that's not a good point. It's not a recommendation to any farmers to apply full nitrogen to soybeans. But this is telling us something. It's telling us that the crop at some point is running out of nitrogen. And the questions that we start looking is, I mean, is there any way that we can help increase productivity, maintain productivity? This also provides some concept or at least some insight saying that potentially there is a cost. Many times we're trying to say, no, there is no cost for soybeans to fix nitrogen. More, many times we say, no, soybeans is doing very fine. We just inoculate the seeds and the plant can fix nitrogen with no problem. This an indication when you look at this data showing you the full fertilization versus nothing. If you are getting more yield with full fertilization, that implies that in that situation when the plant doesn't need to fix and doesn't need to nodulate and consume carbon, because basically that's what the plant is doing most of the times, it will be sending carbon to these nodules. So it's telling us that the plant is producing a little bit more, okay? And then if you wanna go to the main changes over time, again, the grain number is one of the main changes. Grain number is, is, the, is probably the highest cor correlated. So that means that the new varieties that we are producing today, they can increase productivity by adding more pods and increasing the number of seeds, but that increase the carbon cost, that increase the energy cost. And most likely we are seeing that potentially many places we are reaching out plateaus on soybean yields connected to this competition between yield and energy costs and the cost for maintaining the, the nitrogen fixation. So let's go to a more simple idea of, uh, and, uh, and Brian will, will have this concept uh, uh, very strong on his side, he's, he's an expert. And then, but if you look at the, how soybeans are getting nitrogen, so we know that most of the nitrogen in some part is coming from the soil. We know that it's coming from fixation. So this activity that the plants establish in the soil. And then at, towards the end of the season, there is some level of remobilization, what basically is internal movement inside of the plant from the leaves to the seeds. And that also satisfy that need of nitrogen from the seeds. In many situations, it's really hard to see this picture. I mean, if you look at this picture, it's showing you a soybean that is deficient of nitrogen on the left and then sufficient of nitrogen on the right. It's very, very hard to see that. And in many situations, if that happens, usually farmers will not be able to see this until most likely around August or late August. Why we say that and why we say that it's usually around August is because the nitrogen demand for soybeans early in the season is very small. And most likely, the amount of nitrogen that is available on the soils might satisfy the demand. So early in the season, if you are planting mid-May, most likely you will not be able to see much of any deficiency for soybeans. So when the demand starts increasing over time and that plant starts basically exhausting all the nitrogen that is in the soil profile, then we'll start to see the situation that plant is extremely running out of nitrogen and nitrogen is becoming the most limiting factor. So in that case, as uh, um, Tyson explained the co-limitations, in this case, if we are reaching that point, nitrogen is by far the most limiting factor. Uh, and we know that if nitrogen is limiting, most likely in many situations, I mean, that's is, is a, a huge impediment for it. And then the other concept, so we, we go through some of the theory before we get into the fixation on the, on the balance, is this situation. Those plants, these soybean plants, they will establish extremely early in the season when they are only like uh, uh, this, I mean, one or two trifolates. This uh, symbiosis, uh, what we call these basically nodules, 
These are associations that they are symbiotic, I mean, establishing in the roots of the plants. And what happens on that situation is the plant will start fixing carbon, sugars, and moving those sugars to maintain those nodules. Inside of the nodule, if you want to take a look, zoom into the nodule, what will happen is a transformation of the N2 from the air into more simplified forms until they just basically put it in, in a form that is called ureides, which basically this is a form that they will be, the nitrogen is moved to the entire plant, okay? And then there is this, this exchange um, between the plant providing sugars and the nodules providing nitrogen to the plant. As long as everyone is exchanging, everyone is happy. Uh, the challenges will happen later in the season when the plant is starting to say, well, maybe I don't have enough sugars to share with those nodules. And then this is a moment that start triggering a problem because if we stop the fixation, then as I showed before, the plant will start most likely remobilization. And when the plant start remobilization means that the plant start to senesce. And then we will see basically that the plant is basically getting closer and faster to, to the end of the season to maturity. Let me just here are some examples. I mean, this is what we discuss on this, assuming on, on the nodules. I mean, we always talk about this idea. If you split the nodules in half, if you look at this pink coloration, that means that the, those nodules are active and that means that they are fixing nitrogen, okay? And then this is a typical curve, I mean, theoretical function for fixation. So if you look at how the plant will fix nitrogen, as we mentioned before, early in the season, no, planting, the plant is not fixing much as the plant is getting towards, uh, let's say, mid early August is the moment that is, excuse me, fixing more nitrogen is a peak, but also it's at the time that the plant start competing because the seeds, they need more carbon, okay? And this is the issue that we start seeing, and then that's why we are looking at the fixation rate starts going down. And here is an example. We just have, uh, a, we have a few studies collecting data over time. So this is one of the ways to collect data on fixation. So is, is a PI isotopic nitrogen. So we have a reference plant. Our reference is usually uh, unfertilized corn. And then we have a soybean fixing nitrogen. So you will see early in the season, the plant is starting to fix, but the highest peak on fixation is usually around when we are, the soybeans are entering into the seed filling. So here is ex exactly the same. Early in the season is very small fixation, but when the plants are entering into seed filling, uh, usually it's around early late August, early September, and then the numbers start going down. Okay, just to give you an idea of the changes on fixation. So it's not that the plant is fixing all the time nitrogen at the maximum, but it's is changing that. We already explained the mechanisms and the changes. Um, and then one of the main questions that we have in many of these situations is if we can close the gap because the plant demands nitrogen, high demand of nitrogen to increase protein levels. This is coming from the, in some sections from the soil, but exclusively more from the fixation. The question is, can you close the gap? And what will be the gap uh, or the demand that is, is still to be satisfied? This is excellent for many of our meetings. I mean, that we have with farmers and always, if we were in person, I would, we would do probably more like an interactive session. And then I always show this figure because this gives us an idea of what's going on with soybeans. If you look at the seed yield, so if, if I'm looking at a 60 bushel soybeans, uh, look at the 60 bushel soybean, how much nitrogen that plant needs on average. 300 pounds of nitrogen. 300 pounds of nitrogen that are inside of the plant, okay? This is not saying how much are you harvesting. Usually the harvesting, you need to get this number and multiply by 70%, because 70% of that number is usually what is harvested on the seeds. So the question is very simple, no? Because we know now that in order to produce 20 bushels of soybeans, we need 100 pounds. So if, if I produce 40 bushels of soybeans, that means that I basically, those plants, they usually will have around 200 pounds of nitrogen. The main question is, where is that nitrogen coming from? Here is an example. We did a, a nice review study looking at multiple studies in the literature. So if you look at the yields and then the fixation, so it shows that in many situations, as you are increasing yields, 
depending on how much are you fixing, the percentage of nitrogen that you fix, it could be like saying these green lines are representing less than 40%. The red lines are between 50, 60% average. And the blue lines are between 80% average. So what you are seeing is that in a very high situation of fixation, so if you are fixing a lot of nitrogen, in many situations, you are less efficient. So if you, if you say for per unit of nitrogen fix, you are less efficient, which basically give us an, again, if you look at the slopes of each of the curves, these slopes are going down, which basically are telling you that you produce less yield per unit of nitrogen fix. And that happens all the time, which basically, again, is telling us that in many cases, we are not wanted to discuss, but that nitrogen fixation implies a cost. And if I'm fixing more, if I have much better opportunities in the soil to fix nitrogen, then the efficiency, if you want to put it in some way, is compromised. And in order to understand this idea of the demand and the fixation, so here is a, a figure showing us how much the plant will fix and how much the plant demands. So look at the one one line. One one line means that if you see all the points on that line, it means that the plant is satisfying the demand with fixation. How many times you see points on the line? Almost, almost none. And I would say that in many situations, you will have this situation that there is a big gap and the gap is around here, which means that anytime that you have a high demand of nitrogen, and usually it's any time that you are about 35, 40 bushels, most likely you will not be able to fix all the nitrogen. And then that plant will depend on the nitrogen that is coming from the soil, okay? And the question is, can we get that much nitrogen in the soil? Okay, so we have just to close some of these concepts, we were calculating the balance. A balance can be done very simple. The balance in this situation for any legumes or any, any crop that is fixing nitrogen, it can be done to say how much you fix versus how much you remove. The fixation will be the input, the removal will be the output. So let's, one second, let's look at the probabilities. Why we use the probabilities and the frequencies because we have a lot of data. We have a lot of data and then the best way to show this is rather than just to show give you an average, let me give you the data. So in situations that you are fixing very small, less than 28%, so very poor situations for fixation. Most of the data, if you look at this graph, is showing that most of the data is negative. Basically telling us that most of the data in this group is basically telling us that we are living in a negative balance in the soil. In situations that you are fixing 50 or 60%, which is the most, I would say the most regular situation that we can find in, in many of our soils, is a red line. If you look at the red line, most of the data that we collected on those red lines, 85% shows negative balances. How much? In some situations, close to 100 pounds. Only 15% shows a positive balance. And then the only situation that we can see as a more positive is when situations in soils where you are fixing very high, very high, like 80% is a blue line. In those situations, you can think about 50% of the data shows positive and 50% negative. So you are very close to a balance in the soil that is very close to being neutral, okay? And if you wanna look at the numbers, more thinking about numbers is the summary of this graph. If you are in a soil so they are fixing less nitrogen, your balance, how much you remove is very negative. In this case was close to 90 pounds negative. If you are in a situation which is very common in our soils, in between 40 and 70 percent, you are in a slightly negative balance, 30 pounds. And then if you are in a very high situation of fixation, so it's, it's closer to, to zero, okay? This is just to demitify a little bit this idea that soybeans or any legumes, in many situations, they are leaving credits. This shows that in many cases, they are not as credits, okay? It's more like in many cases, we are leaving negative balances in the soils. And just to, to, to finish, I mean, many people think about, oh, there is a high correlation between yield and the balance. So if you have high yield, so you have more negative balances in the soil. This graph shows the balance, okay, of how much nitrogen you leave in the soil and the yields. 
And you can see that if you are fixing a lot of nitrogen, it doesn't matter. If you are fixing a lot of nitrogen very much in those soils, uh, and we can discuss why is that situation, you can have very high yields, but most likely your balances are slightly negative. The problem is not with those high, uh, it's with, more with this line, the green one. The green one are situations where we are pushing very high yields, but we are not fixing enough nitrogen. And then that plant will become extremely dependent from the soil and the balances are becoming extremely negative. And then the problem is the sustainability on those situations, on those green lines. Or long-term sustainability is compromised. How we are planning to see that, in many situations we will be seeing that by losing carbon over time. If we have monoculture soybeans for many years, we start, or any legume that is uh, removing more than fixing, we will start seeing uh, fertility loss, I mean, in the soil, via carbon losses, and we will start seeing all the nutrients being be becoming more deficient over time, more because we are not managing really well the system. And just to give you an idea to close and to give you a big picture what's going on. So if you look over time, this I'm up from the entire US. So you will see soybeans uh, Northeast, some of the sections that we have soybeans in Oklahoma, in Kansas, of course, central and Eastern part of the state, very high on soybeans. If you look at the map from 2013, 14, no? Versus 2016, 17, I think that you will immediately see a change. And what is the main change? Is that we are seeing those small dots are soybean fields. So we are seeing a larger increase on soybean acres. But not only that, we also went to the data and we start looking at how many times we are seeing two years consecutive soybeans. So we have, in 2016, 17, we have 21 million acres, close to 22 million acres, with already fields that they were two years consecutive soybeans. 10 million acres, close to 11, three years of consecutive soybeans. Six million acres with four years of consecutive soybeans, and close to four million acres with five years of consecutive soybeans. And if you look over time in this graph towards the end, you will see that the two years of consecutive soybeans has been going up in the last five, six years. So this is telling us as systems become less profitable and we have more risk, more of the, our farmers are inclined to this idea of testing or looking at this possibility of doing more soybeans. But over time, one of the main challenges that we can face is uh, more specifically that soybeans in many situations, they will be removing more nitrogen that they will be fixing or leaving in the soil, basically using the reservoirs and uh, long-term situation is that if we don't have another crop in the rotation that is like in many cases like corn or sorghum and we are applying nitrogen to satisfy those gaps, we will be seeing long-term changes on the, on the productivity and fertility. So to finish is uh, the fixation might be limited. We are seeing that in many cases is when we have high plant demand. And we are also seeing that in situations that we have, as mentioned before, low pH or other problems that they are compromising fixation, those low M, M fixation environments are making the plant more dependent on the soil and that becomes a long-term problem. We clearly, we still need to investigate more, more if we are thinking about looking at all the legumes in, in this project, trying to understand when and where we are, we are planning to see potential limitation of, of nitrogen because that is something that is not yet clear and for sure it impacts on the sustainability of not only soybeans, but also on the next crop in the rotation. And then for the last point, I mean, one of the concepts that we, we established on the RAIN project is diversifying the rotation. So we are looking at including other legumes. We are looking about increasing diversification, but also taking a look to this process on the fixation uh, in, in order to improve the sustainability. It might need that we need to have good mixes and good uh, systems, not just one crop at a time. In many situations, having a legume like a soybeans or another crop coming with another, like a cereal, corn, sorghum, it really balances the system much better because one of the phases of the system depends more on the fertilizer, the other phase depends less, and most likely we see a much better balance between the, the system. And we truly really need to explore and have my inf more information about the system rather than just one crop. So with that, I hope that um, 
you were able to take some of these. Uh, thanks, Dr. Arnal, for organizing this session. I think that is, at least from my side, I have been learning a lot uh, from previous presentations. It has been very, very productive. So I appreciate the invitation. And I'm open if, if there is any time for, for any, any, any questions. We have time for questions. I've been sent a couple questions. So before I ask the ones that have been sent to me, does anybody have any questions that are online? You can either enter them in chat or go to your audio. Well, while we got people working there, I've got one that said, uh, texted into me, said, what are the other nutrients that are needed? Or let me rephrase, what other nutrients are most important when it comes to nodule uh, production and, and rhizobial activity? Well, that's a, that, that should be more for you than me. Uh, <laughs> I would say that some of the things that we are seeing uh, and of course, depends on the sites. And Brian, you can you can chime in on this because you know Oklahoma by far much better than that. What I uh, have seen, sulfur is is a is a key aspect. In many situations, nitrogen and sulfur are extremely connected. And if we are in soils that they have sandy soils with um, low organic matter, we might be seeing potential sulfur deficiencies. I know that in Oklahoma. I don't think that you have much of a problem yet with sulfur, which is good. <laughs> I can show you pictures from another places in the U.S. and also in Argentina uh, that fields with 10 or 15 years of continuous soybeans were applying 10 pounds of sulfur was giving a 20, 30 bushels <laughs> increase in yields, which is telling you that sulfur is a key aspect. There is a, a lot of research, specifically more, I would say, from Brazil looking at micronutrients, I would say that pH is extremely relevant. And, and Brian has so much research on pH, so he can probably write an entire book, I would say, on, on pH effects on, on crop nutrition. And I think that we are in many situations just neglecting the pH or not even looking at the pH in our soils. We have a small study that we did in Southeast Kansas and we have in the same field, very likely, fortunately, pH levels going from uh, 4.5 to 7. And it was awesome because we look at the potential inoculation. Many times when farmers are asking me the questions, should I inoculate soybeans? I always say my response, I think that is similar to Doribar. We, we kind of are on the same page. We cover ourselves very well. We kind of say all the time, if you can find the cheapest inoculant, do it. <laughs> because it's an insurance policy. We are not seeing much of a response to be honest, but for me, it's always like, if I can find something that is a two or $3, one of the cheapest one, I will just go ahead and do it. More if I'm planting into a, a stress condition, like a late planting soybeans or under drought or under pH problems. Yeah. Just to close the idea in this study, looking at pH, we have, uh, uh, not inoculation, single inoculation, and double inoculation. And it was the only studies uh, that we have seen kind of a response to double inoculations only in pH below 5.5. Okay, when you were in pH is about six or seven, no problems. And, and as Brian can comment on this, pH not only messes with the rhizobia, but it also mess, mess around all the entire soil system. And then many nutrients become less available. And then we start seeing deficiencies or toxicities. So I think that by far, if I need to look at one key element before I start raising any crop and specifically on soybeans, my number one factor will be just to look at pH. Great. I'd agree, Dor uh, Ignacio, much more than sulfur for the, the sulfur studies. A side note, we're actually, we're coming out of cotton on our pH work and we're moving into soybeans in the 2021 season. So both Lofton and I will be doing a lot of soybean work, looking at inoculum and stuff in soybeans. Lofton's done a bunch of inoculum work in Oklahoma and he'd tell you that that is probably the lowest cost, highest return on investment uh, option in soybeans is making sure the inoculum. And even where you would think you have recent soybeans, you have inoculum, you don't always. I got 